Good evening, I'm Andrew Cheng. And I'm Adrian Arsenault. Tonight, a CBC News First. The brothers at the helm of We Charity speak out about what's left in the wake of a political scandal. Do you feel at this point that the Prime Minister has thrown you under the bus? Mark, we, we felt that we were political roadkill and then it got worse. The Fifth Estate investigates the price we paid. Also tonight, once called on by Donald Trump. Stand back and stand by. The Proud Boys are designated a terrorist organization by Canada, the first country to do so. Getting back to business in Alberta and back to class in Ontario. But what about the new coronavirus variants? And earning trust and combating vaccine misinformation in black communities. That is so crucial that that messaging gets out there and it's being delivered by trusted individuals in the community. This is The National. Well, tonight, in the aftermath of a political scandal that rocked their global charity and reshaped its future, Mark and Craig Kielberger are speaking out. In an interview with the Fifth Estate, the founders of We Charity lay out their regrets and frustrations over how it all went down after the organization known for its splashy We Day events was awarded a multi-million dollar government contract. We's connection to Justin Trudeau and its financial ties to his family grabbed headlines, as did the political apologies, the testimony before the House of Commons Finance Committee and the fallout that came next. Mark Kelly with the brothers' reaction to the price they paid. We Day! It was 2015, and the newly elected Prime Minister chose this event for one of his first public appearances. Trudeau had been invited to We Charity events multiple times since entering politics, as were his wife, his mother, his brother. I'll acknowledge that I and Mark, we were politically blind how that would be seen. Full acknowledgement of it. We were working with politicians of all stripes, of all parties, in every region of this country. And frankly, in hindsight, let me be very candid, I wish we hadn't. The Kielbergers sat down with the Fifth Estate. Their spirits, like their children's charity, battered by being at the centre of the We Charity scandal. Well, it wasn't the failure to recuse scandal. Right. It wasn't the Prime Minister scandal. It wasn't the government scandal. It ended up being the We Charity scandal. Last summer, the Prime Minister came under fire for handing the We Charity a multi-million dollar sole source contract to run a program paying students to volunteer during the pandemic and not recusing himself from that cabinet decision. I made a mistake in not recusing myself immediately from the discussions given uh, our family's history. The contract would later be cancelled. Do you feel at this point that the Prime Minister has thrown you under the bus? Mark, we, we felt that we were political roadkill early in July and it only got worse. The charity's fight for survival now getting political. We were naive in how this was going to be seen. We, we own all of that. I wish others would also own their side of it, especially the politicians. We were politically mugged. So, Mark, what does the future look like for the Kielbergers? Well, the Kielbergers tell us that they've begun to sell off assets, the building, their, their head office here in Toronto, to help pay for their uh, overseas works. They continue to do that. And, and they're really trying to put as much daylight between the We Charity and the We Charity scandal. But we know they've been called to testify before the Federal Ethics Committee on uh, February 26th. We know the Federal Ethics Commissioner continues his investigation into Justin Trudeau and the possibility of a conflict of interest here in his relationship with the Kielbergers. So the opposition, as far as they're concerned, this charity, this this scandal still has legs and so there is more to come in your investigation what else did you look into yeah we spoke with dozens of employees both current and former employees about their relationship with the organization some loyal and some who feel like quite disillusioned ultimately this is a story about uh, the deals that they made and ultimately the price that we paid all right mark thank you very much thanks Adrian. you can watch the full fifth estate documentary the price we paid tomorrow at 9 p.m. on CBC Television. Last month, members of the Proud Boys were arrested for their roles in the attack on the U.S. Capitol. Today, a major move from Canada's capital, Ottawa, designated the group a terrorist organization, the first country to do so. Salima Shivji now with the consequences. These scenes of the U.S. Capitol overrun have led to nearly 200 arrests. 
and allegations some members of the far-right extremist group, the Proud Boys, conspired to break in. The violence shockingly well documented, but there was an upside, says Canada's public safety minister. They also provided law enforcement and our intelligence services with a trove of new information. Proud Boys! Evidence that added to the case already being made, security officials say, for Canada to label the Proud Boys a terrorist group, a world first. There has been a, a serious and concerning escalation of, of violent, not just rhetoric, but activity and planning. The Proud Boys joins the list along with three white supremacist groups and nine others, mostly Al-Qaeda and Daesh affiliates. The designation means all will see their activities severely restricted. Banks can freeze assets. Canadians who support the groups can go to rallies. But financial help, even buying hats or T-shirts, could lead to a criminal charge. The immediate designating Proud Boys as a terrorist entity. It comes on the heels of an NDP motion calling for the Proud Boys to be added to the list, but the government insists politics was not a factor. That's not the basis of this decision. This decision has to be based on evidence and law. Still, many experts say even if the intelligence and evidence are there, much of it is kept secret for security reasons, and the NDP's political motion could be fodder for a court challenge. It does diminish the credibility of the entire process when um, there is now evidence for organizations to point to and say, look, this was entirely political. It wasn't based on anything more than the political whims of parliamentarians. A challenge that could be bolstered by the fact that charges against Proud Boys related to the attack on the Capitol have not yet been proven in court. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. Now, a tool behind some of those arrests at the Capitol Hill riots, an app called Clearview AI. It's a powerful surveillance tool, but one that Canadian authorities have decided violated the privacy of millions of people here. Thomas Daigle shows us what led them to that conclusion and whether this country can do anything about it. I'll show you a demo right now. With one click and just a short wait, Clearview AI's founder once showed how easy it is to identify almost anyone, his app providing pictures of individuals without their consent. It's really our belief that the upside completely outweighs the downside. Canadian privacy authorities pointedly disagree, labeling Clearview AI a tool of mass surveillance. They are still collecting information from all over the internet, including the images of Canadians. Clearview scraped more than 3 billion images from social media and other public web pages, building facial recognition technology ostensibly meant for criminal investigations. Pretty much every Canadian can expect to be in this database, so millions of Canadians' profiles and images. U.S. law enforcement is said to be using Clearview to help identify attackers at last month's Capitol Hill riot. Here in Canada, privacy authorities found 48 clients had used the technology, they include police from Vancouver to Toronto and Halifax, plus the RCMP. Even the Rexall pharmacy chain admitted last year an employee tried out the app to identify shoplifters. It's quite clear now that if another company wants to engage in the same kind of behavior, that they're in violation of Canadian privacy laws. UN Stevens got Clearview to provide images it had collected of her. It makes me wonder what they can do with my data. I'm also afraid of discrimination. I'm not white. I'm a person who I could potentially be misidentified as a criminal. Clearview pulled out of Canada last summer. Now the federal privacy commissioner acknowledges he has little leverage to punish the U.S.-based firm and no ability to find Clearview even when newly introduced privacy legislation comes into effect. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. Well, with the number of new COVID-19 cases falling in Canada, more reopening plans are emerging, like Ontario's to reopen schools, even in hard-hit areas. We're going to get to that in a moment. But first, Alberta's plan to get back to business while dealing with the new, more contagious variants of the virus. To try to stop them from spreading, Alberta has announced a new, longer quarantine for anyone living with someone testing positive with a variant. They must stay in isolation for up to 24 days. It's also expanded a program to help people isolate for free in hotels. But as Rafi Bujikanian explains, there is a delicate balancing act underway between containing the virus, its new mutations, and reopening the economy. 
For this chain of sandwich shops in Edmonton, the cons of reopening to indoor dining outweigh the pros. Especially with people coming in and out for, for the lunch rush, um, there would just be too many people unmasked eating. They've adapted to a new business model in the pandemic and will stick to it even when Alberta lets restaurants reopen on Monday. But at this gym, a different story. The owner is anxious to reopen. She took a private training contract in the U.S. just to keep the lights on. It's like 10 people are relying on me to keep my doors open. And I need to come down here to make this money and so that I can keep them employed. It's that kind of pressure on small business the Alberta government is trying to alleviate by reopening. But the province is also trying to contain new strains of COVID first seen in the UK and South Africa. 57 cases now, eight with no links to travel. If we see a trend that we're seeing more um, situations where we're picking up variants and we can't link it to anything, I, I think it'd be important to relook at the plan to open further. The province says it won't let the situation get there. Anyone living with an Albertan diagnosed with one of the more contagious strains now has to isolate for 14 days after their last contact. If the initial case quarantines at home instead of in a hotel for free, that could stretch up to 24 days. And should numbers keep rising, then we may have to uh, tighten measures again. I know no one wants to be on the roller coaster. Still, it's something the province prefers avoiding. Part of the reason it's taking a slower approach to relaunching the economy than it did last spring. Rafael Bujikani and CBC News, Edmonton. Ontario is the only province with kids still out of the classroom. But with new cases on the decline, the plan today is to send the kids back. While this has not been easy on Ontario parents, on students and on our education staff, I want to be clear that safety is what has and what will drive our decisions every step of the way. While students from most public health regions can go back to the classroom starting on Monday, Three of the largest regions will have to wait a little longer. In Toronto, Peel and York Region, close to 800,000 students will have to wait until February 16th to return. As Deanna Sumanak Johnson explains, the news has some parents breathing a sigh of relief. This mom of three has been trying to make light of the situation. She co-designed this t-shirt, expressing the frustration of Ontario parents that's selling out online. In the coming days, an announcement will be announced. <laughs> but all jokes aside, today's announcement was a relief. That was very exciting. <laughs> I want the government to, to take our mental health seriously. I've got this one, we've got a baby um, and a toddler. So trying to stretch myself to give everybody what they need has been, has been tough. Ontario is the last province to keep kids out of physical classrooms. In Toronto and the surrounding areas, students will have been out of school for five out of the last 12 months. That's not counting the regularly scheduled holidays. But the back to school plans will have to take into account the new coronavirus variants. We've really elevated and enhanced the measures in place. New measures include mandatory masking for students grades one to three and expanded asymptomatic testing in schools. Shamila Shaquille has three kids going back on February 16th. She's not sure new measures are enough. What's going to make it safe that, that you know, that it wasn't safe in December? And we're not hearing that piece. We're not hearing what they're doing because class sizes aren't get, getting reduced. They haven't really done much about ventilation. But it's about balance. And some experts say keeping kids at home for longer does another kind of harm. This doctor was among a hundred who signed a letter to the government to reopen schools. When people talk about safe, it's not just about being safe from COVID. It's about doing what we need to do to ensure our children's, you know, long-term safety. And, and school is a, a, a big part of that. <laughs> and that's something Rebecca Ackerman agrees with. While she worries for her daughter's safety, she says learning from home was just not sustainable. She hopes this time she's back in class to stay. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, so at the heart of all of this, the unpredictability of the variants that we know have a toehold in Canada. So joining us now to talk about that, infectious diseases specialist, Dr. Zane Chagla. Dr. Chagla, what is the obstacle to developing a fuller picture of, of how much of the variant is actually out there? Test more aggressively. 
So many reference labs are starting to develop a, a screening test that then gets reflexed to sequencing testing, which is the higher level testing that confirms these variances' presence. Uh, the problem is, is many of our tests are for, for me generally would be done at one of hundreds of different labs. My positive sample has to then go to that reference lab, has to be screened, then has to go get sequenced. And so there is a delay to getting it. Uh, not to mention, obviously, the resources needed to make sure that everyone has this available testing. So mm. unfortunately, at the time being, not everyone has a, a chance to get this tested, although right. it is increasing day by day. So until we develop that capacity, I mean, can we extrapolate w with the data we do have to figure out how much of the variant is out there? Yeah, I mean, it's hard without a denominator, but we are seeing increasing number of community cases day by day without any tr clear travel link. And I think the numbers are starting to creep into the 1% to 2% range as time moves on. So uh, I think we can get a sense as, as testing scales up, we're going to start seeing more and more and more as we start seeing more of that iceberg. Okay, Dr. Chagla, good of you to join us. Thank you so much. No problem. Well, the International COVID Vaccine Alliance, COVAX, says Canada can expect to receive between 1.9 and 3.2 million doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine before June. It doesn't require the same ultra cold chain storage and so can be administered in different settings. So it just adds to the portfolio. Now, COVAX pools funds from Canada and other wealthy nations. The goal being primarily to provide vaccines for developing countries, but which also provides a mechanism for those countries to secure doses from the pool for themselves. Canada, so far, is the only G7 country to exercise that right. Worth noting, Health Canada has not yet approved the AstraZeneca vaccine, but once it does, Ottawa already has a separate order in for 20 million doses purchased directly from the company itself. Canadian officials were allowed virtual consular access to Michael Spaver today. Global Affairs says it can't share any more about the visit, but said that the Canadian government remains deeply concerned by the arbitrary detention by Chinese authorities of Michael Kovrig and Michael Spaver and continues to call for their immediate release. So, too, do the families of the two Michaels. And as Katie Simpson tells us from Washington, they are hoping a new president and the White House could bring a renewed sense of urgency to the case. Michael Kovrig turns 49 today. It's his third birthday locked away in a Chinese jail. By all accounts, he's still healthy and he looks healthy and his spirits are... Um, he's hanging in. Kovrig's wife tempers her expectations, but sees now as a chance to build momentum to free her husband and fellow Canadian Michael Spaver with the new Biden administration. We have a group of uh, people who are not only competent and uh, dedicated and want to do the right thing, but they also want to restore decency and leadership, both domestically and internationally. And I believe with that kind of ally, um, there's greater hope and opportunity for us to find a resolution. Kovrig and Spaver were detained by China in 2018 in what is widely seen as retribution for Canada's arrest of Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou on an extradition request from the United States. This White House is equally committed, if not more committed, to helping move forward with this, you know, and get, get some results as soon as we can. The president, vice president and White House staffers have discussed the urgency of this situation with their Canadian counterparts. On top of that, Robert Malley, the new U.S. envoy to Iran, he knows Kovrig. He was his boss at a global think tank. It means that we're confident that they, they are fully aware of his case and that they'll do what they can. Now that we have all of this support and momentum. While and public reassurances help, Kovrig's wife wants something tangible, new efforts and actions. How do we seize the moment to make sure that Michaels are free as soon as possible? As she waits for a breakthrough, now, she hopes Canadians now, keep her husband in mind, soon, especially now. on his birthday. I want them to think of Michael as an incredibly, incredibly strong man. Um, forgive me. Who, um, who's showing tremendous courage. Courage that will continue to be tested under the most difficult of circumstances. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Well, three days after the military seized power in Myanmar, protests are underway, and the country's generals have charged Aung San Suu Kyi with possession of illegally imported walkie-talkies.
Now that may sound bizarre, but as Sasha Petrosik explains, it allows them to keep her detained. The banging and beeping echoes through Yangon again. Today is louder than yesterday. Residents at their windows, cars on the streets, defying a curfew, fearing a crackdown. I think the government will do something if it gets louder and louder, longer and longer. Doctors and nurses lead this resistance, refusing to obey the generals who swept aside a civilian government Myanmar's people elected en masse. Today, the leader of that government, Nobel laureate Aung San Suu Kyi, was charged with several minor offenses, enough for the military to justify her detention. We feel sorry for Mother Suu Kyi, says this man. We really did not expect this coup. If anything, the army is tightening its grip. With tanks, troops and barricades, as General Min Ong Hyang vows to exercise emergency powers for the next year. In New York, members of the UN Security Council continue to negotiate a statement to express the world's indignance. China seems reluctant to take a hard line. After all, it stands to benefit from Myanmar's break with the West. But it also denies it's protecting Myanmar's generals. It's not true, said a spokesman. China just wants the two sides to uphold stability. Regardless of what China does, there are many, many options uh, for the United States, for Canada, uh, for the European Union, for ASEAN, for so many countries um, to take action. Until then, the people of Myanmar remain frustrated that the democracy they celebrated turned out to be so uncertain. Sasha Petrosik, CBC News, Toronto. We want to show you a special moment in the UK tonight when a tribute to a man who captured imaginations around the world stopped a country in its tracks as Brits joined forces to honour the late Captain Sir Tom Moore. From frontline workers to the Prime Minister, an entire nation came together. They celebrated the 100-year-old veteran who died yesterday after contracting COVID-19. Moore won the public's affections after raising millions for pandemic relief. His family said they were incredibly touched and joined in with huge love in their hearts. Hmm. Powerful tribute. Okay, still ahead on The National. The relationship between black communities and health care and why it's crucial for the vaccine rollout. During the most vulnerable and crucial moments of my entire life, my care was mishandled. Addressing vaccine hesitancy in the black community by talking about trust and the healthcare system. Plus, don't hold my black body to the floor. A Canadian filmmaker spotlights her personal story on the big screen and gets a shout out from Hollywood. But first, whoa, what are you doing? Well, what are you doing? Schitt's Creek continues its hot streak with the Golden Globes. We are back in two. looks messy, doesn't it? An explosive celebration in the Toronto Raptors locker room last night after Fred Van Vliet delivered a historic 54-point game. That is both a franchise record and the most points ever scored by an undrafted player in the NBA. He joins DeMar DeRozan, Terrence Ross, and Vince Carter as the only Raptors to break the 50-point mark in a single game. Well, it's Thursday in Australia, and these courts at the Australian Open are now empty. Up to 600 athletes and training staff are in isolation, pending results of COVID tests after a worker at the hotel where they were staying tested positive. Warm-up matches scheduled for today have been cancelled, but officials still expect the tournament to go ahead as planned next week. Well, despite COVID's ability to throw a wrench into just about any plan, this summer's Olympics are also moving forward. The full set of rules for athletes are still yet to come. But today, organizers in Tokyo unveiled their first set of strict rules for people accompanying them. And spoiler alert, celebrating a win is going to look very different. Greg Rasmussen has the details. Normally, it's all crowds, close contact, and long, loud cheering. 
But under new ground rules laid out today, this summer's Olympics will be much more sedate, as high fives, handshakes and hugs will all be taboo. So how are, how are you training right now? Uh, pretty hard since we're Canadian swimmer Marcus Thormeyer will be expected to basically show up, compete, the and then leave. Like, I'd love it if the stands were packed, but if it's not the safe thing to do, then don't do it. Hygiene, spacing and mask use will be a must, while bars and restaurants in Tokyo will be a no-go for the first two weeks in the country. Each delegation will have uh, a COVID officer monitoring the implementation of these rules. Violations could result in expulsion. Visiting delegations will need to carry proof of a recent negative COVID test and download a tracing app. On the delicate issue of giving shots to otherwise healthy young athletes, the IOC says you will not be required to have received a vaccine in order to participate, but getting a shot is encouraged if possible. Swimmer Thormeyer remains hopeful there will be a successful launch of the Games after last year's delay, despite worries about the pandemic. Shut out the noise, let focus in on training, competing, and just, yeah, go there to represent Canada the best we can. It's now also one year away from the launch of another Olympics, the Winter Games, with host country China facing not only worries about what the pandemic will look like then, but also calls for a boycott over its record on human rights. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. The little Canadian show that everybody loves is set up for another possible awards night sweep. Hi, my name is Alexis Rose, represented by Alexis Rose Talent. Welcome, you! Schitt's Creek received five Golden Globes nominations this morning. The nod going to all four lead actors and for best TV musical or comedy series. The creator and showrunner, Dan Levy, tweeting his excitement at the news. What are my hobbies? What's my name? Sorry, maybe that one's too hard. And with a nomination for this film, the Globes might have been looking for a redo of last year when not a single woman was nominated for Best Director. This year, a record three women directors included in the category. But critics say the awards are still falling short when it comes to BIPOC nominees, with only 10% on the TV side. This year, do not expect the normal room packed with stars and champagne. Host Tina Fey and Amy Poehler will be in different cities and nominees will appear virtually from locations around the world. Okay, coming up, a broken relationship between black Canadians and healthcare could be leading to increased vaccine hesitancy. That is so crucial that that messaging gets out there and it's being delivered by trusted individuals in the community. Plus, the consequences of Canada's travel ban on Jamaica's economy. That was a shocker to us because we get a lot of business from Canada. What's at stake when beachgoers don't show up? Stay with us. Welcome back. It is a community that has been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19, but many black Canadians distrust the healthcare system. Today, Toronto unveiled a new plan to try to address that. In the case of the fight against COVID-19, we realized that we needed a more targeted approach to reach black communities. That approach will include millions of dollars in funding and partnering with several agencies to provide community outreach. But as Janella Massa, the host of Canada Tonight, explains, despite that commitment, the challenge will be tough. I wasn't being listened to, my feelings, my autonomy. I walked away from this experience just traumatized. Brianna Taylor still struggles to talk about her experience giving birth to her daughter in 2019. During the most vulnerable and crucial moments of my entire life, my care was mishandled by those that I was supposed to have been able to have, you know, the utmost trust and confidence in. So now when it comes to the vaccine, you know, I'm definitely hesitant. The 20 year old runs an Instagram page called Black Motherhood Collective. In a recent post, she aimed to shed light on why she and so many others are wary of the COVID-19 vaccine. Troubling stats like this one from a 2018 study out of the U.S. show that 84% of pregnancy-related deaths were black women. 
anybody who has any sense of the history of the healthcare system and the black community would totally understand why any black person would be hesitant um, when it comes to the vaccine. While black people may not be the only ones hesitant about the vaccine, they may be more likely to be. A survey by Ecos Research in December found 32% of racialized respondents said they would not take the vaccine, compared to 21% of non-racialized people. But the stakes are high for neighborhoods like this one in Toronto's northwest end. The predominantly black and brown community has been a COVID hotspot since the start of the pandemic. One look around, it's not hard to understand why. Then they have to go to work every day. <laughs> They're essential workers, many of them. Toronto's black community has been hardest hit. Black patients making up a quarter of hospitalizations from COVID-19, the highest of any race group in Toronto, despite being just 9% of the population. One would think that would make black Canadians eager for access to a vaccine. But community advocates say skepticism abounds. When we talk about vaccines, again, there's that mistrust. Something will now be injected into your body. Can we trust that substance? Can we trust what, what's happening? Cheryl Prescott, the executive director of the Black Creek Community Health Center, says this fear of the medical system comes from a very real place. We know that, you know, studies were done um, in the black community, for example, by public health agencies in Tuskegee, for example, where black men were engaged in the syphilis study. And that's something that folks know and I think builds the mistrust. The Tuskegee syphilis study experimented on black men in Alabama over 40 years without their consent. Experts say understanding the historic and present day systemic racism in healthcare has to be addressed as the COVID-19 vaccine is rolled out. It's important to ensure that the uh, messaging relating to vaccine prioritization is appropriate um, and is very transparent and very clear uh, so that there's no misinterpretation of intent. In other words, um, there's no perception that they're being used as guinea pigs. Dr. Upton Allen is head of infectious diseases at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. And he's been meeting with government officials, encouraging them to create specific strategies targeted at vaccine rollout in the black community. What are some of the things that you hear from people in the black community that creates a barrier for them to want to take the vaccine when it will be available? Number one is uh, a trust of the healthcare system. Second is misinformation or just people getting wrong information or data that uh, drive their decisions. There are quite a few questions in the chat, so. In the meantime, community groups are being proactive. I can tell you though that I know people who've been vaccinated uh, and uh, they've been okay. So holding information sessions like this one, hoping they can help get them ready for the vaccine when it's their turn. That is so crucial that that messaging gets out there and it's being delivered by trusted individuals in the community. For many like Brianna, the responsibility still lies with those at the top. Show the effort, make the effort and let us know that this is something that you're very serious about and you're adamant about repairing the relationship and making sure that there is a level of trust between the black community and healthcare professionals so that we can have confidence moving forward. I love you. It's still unclear exactly when vaccines might be available for these impacted communities. Just today, the City of Toronto announced it will invest millions in a black community COVID response plan. So, Janella, what more do we know about the efforts the local governments are making to try to address it? Well, Adrian, we heard today from the City of Toronto, $6.8 million in investment. That'll go directly to black community groups who've already been doing this work, like Cheryl Prescott, who we saw there in her organization. And from the province of Ontario, they say phase two of the vaccine rollout, that'll include essential workers, like the people who live in those COVID-19 hotspots. And they also pointed out that last month, they committed $12.5 million in funding for culturally sensitive community outreach in 15 high priority communities. And they admit that there is a gap in data when it comes to socioeconomic groups and COVID-19, and that is still a challenge that has to be overcome. Adrian. All right. Thank you, Janella. Janella Massa, host of Canada Tonight. And next, we do have more to talk about on this, specifically on the question of how exactly to rebuild trust where it's been lost. 
that conversation. Stay with us. Well, before the break, we explored how some members of the black community feel about vaccines and more broadly, Canada's healthcare system. But let's dig a little deeper on this, on, on understanding the problem and figuring out how to approach it with Dr. Zane Chagla, an infectious diseases specialist with St. Joseph's Healthcare, and Akwatu Kenti, the chair of the City of Toronto's Black Community COVID-19 Response Plan, uh, which was announced today. Akwatu, if I could start with you, can, can you help me fine-tune my understanding of the problem? Because we shouldn't be tempted to think that there is a, a singular Black community here that is uniformly hesitant, right? Yeah, no, no, no. We have several communities, and um, the risk are divided according to income, housing, occupation, um, and habits, work habits. And um, they're not equally divided. Um, so it requires some degree of complexity in terms of analysis, but simplicity in terms of delivery. Right. Delivering the message, I mean. And, and Dr. Chagla, I mean, the, the pressure points, of course, are different, uh, but, but so are the stakes, depending on who we're talking about, because you can't talk about race without talking about living conditions, without working conditions as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think it's very clear from the data that's been distributed to date, minority communities, uh, particularly the black and the brown communities have had significant issues with it. They're overrepresented in case counts. They're overrepresented in deaths from COVID-19. And much of it has to do with some of the other determinants of health in terms of poverty, in terms of instability, in terms of housing, in terms of the need to expose themselves to communities uh, and, and put themselves out as essential workers to provide for other people that can shelter at home safely. And so many of those things add up to a, a higher risk for COVID-19 and need to be considered as part of the planning for vaccine plans and other public health measures. So, Akwatu, how, how do you even begin to deal with that? Like, like, like even just on a human-to-human -human level, when you encounter skepticism what do those folks want to hear what do you tell them well i encounter skepticism all the time friends and family members i live in the black community so what what do i tell them all the time i tell them that vaccines will not give you the disease that's one of the myths that's going around here the uh, mis misinformation it won't give you covid it won't give you hiv it won't make you infertile i tell them that although the vaccine was produced expeditiously, um, it was produced in a methodologically sound fashion, and it actually utilized a lot of um, previous research work um, to sort of um, hasten the process. I mean, it, you know, instead of doing things sequentially, it was done in parallel. And, and so the process is sound. They can have confidence in the process. I tell them that the vaccines will not alter their DNA. There won't be any microchips going into their body as a result of the vaccine. Side effects don't, don't include significant mortality risk. There's more mortality risk um, with um, COVID. And I also tell them they happen to live in a city, a province where anti-racism is enshrined in law and actually taken to higher levels, that certain things that happened in the past, historical exploitation of people of color, especially black people and indigenous people, are less likely to happen now. I don't say they won't happen now. I say they're less likely to happen now. So Dr. Chagall, if I could ask you one more question how best to walk the talk, right? Because we can, we can give the information, but, but we've got to do more than just persuade with words. We, we've got to sort of actually show those who are hesitant that the vaccine is safe and, and also worth getting. So, so how do you approach that? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the work that Mr. Kente is doing and others is, is essentially that. It's creating champions within the community. It's creating positions of trust not just in medicine, not just in the news, but actual community leaders, cultural leaders, religious leaders, make them the champions as they're often the ones that reach the ones in their communities better than officials. Uh, and, and communicating across all channels, across social media, across traditional media, using WhatsApp. Uh, there are just so many pathways here where people get their information, they perceive trust, they clarify their needs. And any plan to make vaccinations move forward needs to include these as part of an equity approach to make sure people get the appropriate vaccine for them. Okay, uh, we're going to leave it there. Dr. Zane Chagla, Akwatu Kenti, thank you so much, uh, both of you, for joining us tonight. I appreciate your time. Thank you. No problem.
With no Canadian flights heading to the Caribbean, Jamaica is feeling the economic impact. Tourism is the lifeblood of our country. So what happens to Jamaica when Canadians can't travel abroad? Plus... That draws me to the black sometimes. It makes me sit upright. A Canadian filmmaker lands a spot at Sundance and gets a big boost from a Hollywood name. We're back in a moment. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner, the threat of new variants of the coronavirus popping up around the world and the need for a truly global vaccination response. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Air Canada has grounded Rouge again. Now, usually at this time, the low-cost airlines would be carrying passengers to those sunspots like Mexico and the Caribbean. But... Ottawa's grounding of flights to vacation destinations means all flights are suspended as of Monday. 80 employees will be laid off. And there are job losses in those tourist destinations as well. Jamaica, for example. And as Stephen D'Souza shows us, it has many on the island feeling abandoned. For months, Noel Harris's tour bus has been empty. But with tourists starting to trickle back over the winter, he was hoping work would pick up. Then Canada cancelled all flights to the Caribbean. That was a shocker to us because we get a lot of business from Canada. Tourism is the lifeblood of our country. The pandemic has already cost more than 100,000 Jamaicans who work in tourism their jobs. I got a lot of calls every day from, you know, friends who are having serious problems, you know, just don't know how they're going to cope, where the next meal coming from. In December 2019, more than 52,000 Canadians visited Jamaica. Last December, it was just under 11,000. Jamaica's Minister of Tourism estimates Canada's decision will cost his country upwards of $350 million. Yes, it is painful. Yes, it is difficult. And it is causing us, um, you know, as we say, some unintended consequences. The flight cutoff comes after the Jamaican government and resorts work to ramp up testing to accommodate travelers needing a negative result before flying home. Testing that's still not easily available to Jamaican residents. And it's one of the, the, the ironies of Jamaica and how much more the government values tourism and tourists than their own people. With Jamaica's official COVID numbers relatively low and mass vaccinations in North America, Tourism operators hope the pain from the flight cancellations is only temporary. Let's take the bitter pill, let's tighten our belts, and let's, um, let's work this out. Though some warn a turnaround may not come until next winter. There's bright uh, days ahead, and we just have to hold strong. A faith that with vaccines and time, business here will soon get back on track. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. Well, next on The National, a behind-the-scenes look at a powerful short film at Sundance. Don't hold my black body to the floor. The filmmaker and the story behind her boost from a big Hollywood name, next in our moment. Our cousins, the Blackfoot, like to do things old school, raw. This is from the film Black Bodies, created by Canadian filmmaker Kelly Fife Marshall. It was named a top 10 film of 2020 by TIFF and is now premiering at the Sundance Film Festival. But this week, it got a big boost from a big Hollywood name. The story behind the film and the shout out is tonight's moment. Black Bodies is a film about what it's like to be black during the 21st century. All the things that black skin what happens with when you have black skin within this time. It was inspired by a racial incident that was a part of a racial viral incident. I needed a way for the trauma to come out. I needed a way to heal. I turned to what I know, which is filmmaking and black bodies. We decided to go for festivals. It premiered at TIFF. Today's our last day at Sundance. I think there's two black films coming from Canada and we are the only all black female team. And we weren't getting the respect that we know that we deserve. Day in, day out. So I tweeted about that in frustration. And, and Ava DuVernay saw it, and she messaged me back and said, what's the film called? And I told her, and then she tweeted about it and said, go and support. Canada needs to stand up and start supporting their artists. A big shout out to Canada being like, let's, let's just take care of who, who we have, the talent that we have, and let's invest in our own talents. 
Yeah, well, that's a pretty cool shout out. And it, so it, it's a pretty short film, and I, I, I wish we could have heard more of it because the dialogue is, is largely in, in a kind of poetic verse, and because, you know, there's a big message in a short amount of time, and you just felt dialogue wouldn't cut it, so. Well, and it, it's such a huge thing to get into Sundance, right? So yeah, there's six yeah. Canadian films in, in there out of, out of the 118 they chose. But that one shout out, the beauty of social media, mm. Ava DuVernay has 2.7 million followers. So she told all of them to watch out for this, right. and it matters. Mm. That is the National for February the 3rd. Good night. Good night.